Uh, I'm Stephanie Pell. I'm with the Army Cyber Institute, and I'm going to give a brief introduction to lay the groundwork uh, for the topics that this panel will be discussing, and in the course of this introduction, um, I will introduce our esteemed panel. The prosecution of the current crypto wars and the attendant evolution of the going dark debate lead inevitably to a discussion of law enforcement hacking. That is, the extent to which the law should facilitate and regulate such hacking and whether other policies and processes are or should be in place to mitigate potential cybersecurity problems resulting from law enforcement's increasing use of hacking as an investigative tool. To offer an extremely simplified explanation of the going dark debate, assuming there's no one in the room who, who isn't familiar with it, the going dark debate concerns how society and, and the technology industry should address the challenges law enforcement faces due to the increasing use of encryption and other cybersecurity technologies that, among other things, protect data in motion and data at rest such that a provider of a communication service or a mobile device is not able to decrypt a user's data and consequently law enforcement cannot get access to this plain text data. Going dark challenges also include the use of anonymization technologies, which by masking a user's location generally masks his or her identity as well. Law enforcement hacking, that is, law enforcement's exploitation of vulnerabilities to deliver malware to computers and mobile devices to obtain data before it is encrypted or after it is decrypted or to unmask a user's location is one proposed solution to the challenges law enforcement faces from encryption and anonymization technologies. In a recent high-profile investigation known as the Playpen operation, the FBI deployed what they call a Network Investigative Technique, or NIT, which is the government's name for court-approved court use of malware to exploit a vulnerability. In this case, uh, a vulnerability that, among other things, when exploited, allowed law enforcement to identify the IP addresses of individuals who use Tor anonymization technology to visit a child pornography website located on the dark web. In the course of the litigation, Mozilla, the maker of the Firefox browser, filed a motion to compel the FBI to disclose this unknown vulnerability so that the company could determine if a patch for its Firefox browser would be necessary to protect Firefox users. Moreover, in 2015, the Tor project's adoption of automatic security updates means that most users of Tor are now far more likely to be running up-to-date software. This development will likely necessitate the exploitation of unknown or zero-day vulnerabilities for future operations targeting individuals who use Tor to hide on the dark web. In the FBI versus Apple case, which has been discussed uh, quite a lot at this conference, when the FBI could not access the data on the work phone of one of the San Bernardino shooters, it ultimately hired a private third-party entity to a deliver a tool that allowed the government to hack into the phone. The FBI's contract with the third-party entity for its services apparently did not provide the Bureau with access to or knowledge of the vulnerability itself, which, from a practical perspective, meant that the FBI had no ability and thus no obligation to disclose the vulnerability to an interagency process called the Vulnerability Equities Process, or VEP, a process that determines if and when the US government 
should disclose previously unknown vulnerabilities to companies so they can be patched. Now, we can presume, of course, that law enforcement agencies are not the only ones that exploit vulnerabilities for purposes of delivering malware and ultimately penetrating a system. Indeed, recent news reports about a collection of security exploits for internet routers alleged to have been taken or stolen from the NSA and then disclosed by a group called the Shadow Brokers has raised a number of questions about the processes our intelligence community follows in evaluating whether they should exploit or disclose security vulnerabilities, particularly when they believe their tools may have been lost or stolen by a foreign intelligence service. At least according to news reports, one of the vulnerabilities disclosed by the shadow brokers had been lurking in Cisco's hardware since 2013. Cisco has stated that it was not aware of this vulnerability. Moreover, according to one expert who has analyzed the shadow broker exploits, another one of the flaws had been present in numerous Cisco products for over 14 years. Is it not fair to ask, whether other foreign governments may have benefited from these previously undisclosed vulnerabilities as well. As hacking becomes a more common technique for law enforcement and presumably continues to be an important tool for the intelligence community, what are the government's obligations with respect to disclosure of previously unknown vulnerabilities to the companies responsible for those products? What kinds of considerations should inform questions regarding if and when to make such a disclosure? How does the current VEP balance the relevant equities at stake? What kinds of roles do or should government agencies play in facilitating the disclosure of previously unknown vulnerabilities? Do we have enough relevant data in and information about the risks effects and consequences of both disclosure and non-disclosure of zero-day vulnerabilities used by, the, used by U.S. government agencies such that we can develop and eventually codify policy concerning if, when, and under what circumstances vulnerability disclosure should take place. Our distinguished panel we'll discuss and debate these and other questions. We're going to start off with 15 minutes of remarks from each panelist. First, Ari Schwartz, the Managing Director for Cybersecurity Services at Venable LLP, will begin giving us some background on the VEP, a process with which he became very familiar while he was a Special Assistant to President Obama and Senior Director for Cybersecurity Policy at the White House National Security Council. Second, Dave Itell, founder, president, and CEO of Immunity, Inc., a boutique cybersecurity firm, and a former security scientist at the NSA who was recruited by the agency at the age of 18, will give his assessment of the VEP, telling us how, among other things, he thinks the current public discourse on vulnerability disclosure is getting it all wrong. Finally, Dr. Steve Belevin, a professor of computer science at Columbia University and a cryptographer who has been reverse engineering software for 40, for more than 40 years, will respond and give his views on the subject. When the opening remarks have concluded, I will exercise the moderator's privilege and ask questions for five or 10 minutes, and then I will throw the questioning open to our audience. So with that, Ari, please start us off. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's good to be here this afternoon. I'm going to talk a little bit, as Stephanie said, about the vulnerab vulnerabilities equities process. Um, for those, uh, we, I put out, put out a paper uh, this past summer with my former colleague, Rob Kanaki, um, at the Belfer Center at, in the Kennedy School. Um, 
where, which goes into detail in this. So I urge those of you that are interested in this to take a look at the full paper. Um, I will do as best I can to uh, touch on the, uh, and spend most of the time on the recommendations that we have for the future of the VEP process, but want to give uh, a little bit of background to help frame the rest of the panel here. So let me first start with the history of the process. Um, the, the, the VEP really started um, back in the Bush administration in January 2008. Um, there was, uh, as part of the CNCI, the Comprehensive National Cybersecurity Initiative, um, there was a, an effort to get some of the vulnerabilities that the government had been receiving and make sure that they got to the right place um, to, to the vendors uh, that where the, they could fix those problems. Um, too much, of, too many, it was seen at that time that too many of the issues were coming in and there wasn't enough conversation between the government and researchers in the government um, and the, the vendors uh, at that time. Um, and the, a multi, the, the, the multi-government agency gov government group working at the ODNI uh, was the one that kind of came up with the idea of the VEP and, uh, and getting it, moving it forward. Um, having a systematic process to get the vulnerabilities uh, to where they need to be. Um, for the next uh, several years, the, that process um, did not really meet regularly. Um, they uh, were not uh, actively formed in the process. Um, but then uh, at post uh, the Snowden NSA disclosures, um, there was a change in the uh, attitude around the, these issues to say, um, we, put the, we had that process in place, that was the right idea. How do we do it in a way that we can make sure that, those, that it actually meets, um, that there's a regular discussion around this space, and that we have the balance right? Um, the, the, there was a strong feeling at that time, uh, both from leadership and from pretty much all of the agencies involved, that we should, we should move to, toward leaning towards disclosure. If you have a reason to keep it, and we can come up with a number of reasons why you might need to keep it as part of the vulnerabilities equity process, you should keep it. However, the, the, we should default to, if you don't have a reason, that it should be disclosed. Um, and the NSC uh, put together that process, managed it. Uh, as I said, my colleague uh, Rob Kanaki was the first person that set it up at that point, which is why one of the reasons that it, uh, uh, you know, we have some good insight into how it's been working. Um, NSA was des designated as the uh, secretariat for the VEP. Um, it is, uh, there's this review board, which is made up of the agency players, uh, that looks at whether we should retain or disclose it, based on the, the questions that have been uh, developed over time. Um, and new vulnerabilities are disclosed to, that, to the executive secretary. Um, when, they, when there are new vulnerabilities, they notify each of the points of contacts on the ERB. The ERB comes in and meets uh, rel regularly at this point, and then the ERB is responsible for the decisions whether to disclose or not. Um, and then there's a, an annual uh, oversight mechanism um, that's published uh, for the age, all the agencies to see what has been done throughout the year. So it's an internal uh, oversight mechanism. Um, we, in, in looking at this issue, we, we focused on uh, ways to formalize and, um, and, and make recommendations on this. Um, the, 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 for those of you that know uh, the, some of the history here, um, as after the VEP was recreated, there was not a public announcement that it, that it had happened. Um, it only came out after the Heartbleed incident. Um, and, and when the, the Harpley vulnerability was out there and there was some blame that was put, placed onto the U.S. government that the U.S. government probably knew about this and didn't do anything about it. And, and in order to address that concern, um, Michael Daniel wrote a blog post that went into detail about the, the, how we go about making the decisions um, in this case. Uh, did not know about, the, the heart, heart, about Harpley in advance. Um, if we were to find a vulnerability at this point, this is the process that we would use, and that was the VEP. Um, and, 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 and asked really high-level questions about it that, that, that addressed a lot of the issues. At the same time, uh, after that announcement was made, uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, EFF, uh, made a FOIA request uh, to get the information about the, uh, more information about the VEP. Um, and, and so now more of it has been made public, but of course, when you have a whole set of classified uh, documents that were written to be classified that then become uh, declassified, a lot is blacked out in there and it's not clear as to what has been published and what is not being published. It's not something that is directly written um, for an unclassified audience. 
um, and for the public. Uh, so you get a, a situation where uh, there's a feeling, and a lot of the press around this has said, that the government is hiding some of the details about this. Um, and so Rob and I were, were, were really trying to um, analyze the, the process here, still get at that right balance um, of, of how do we know that the VEP is doing the job that it said that it was going to do and get that balance right of keeping what they need to keep in order to do, to do the missions of the agencies, but disclosing things to the vendors so that they can fix things or things that they do not need to keep. Um, and that balance is really the, where we put our recommendations. Um, we were, the first thing is to formalize the VEP, the first recommendation, um, to, to have some real backbone to it. Um, again, it was created in that um, through, through a policy directive um, from a report that, went, that was related to that policy directive um, and then uh, formalized through a NSC process. Um, we felt as though it's important to have a public uh, version of that process at this point. Uh, we were, we're strongly recommending uh, that it be done through, a, through an executive order. Um, we thought that it's important to, to publish, publicize the high-level criteria um, as part of the, the, the executive order. Um, most of that is already done through the, the, this blog post. Um, we generally think that uh, policy through blog post is probably not the best way to instantiate a, uh, a uh, new program. Um, at the time, you know, that's the way that things just happened in the space. Um, and I don't think Michael Daniel would, stand, would say that that's the, the, last, the, the way that he was hoping that this would be uh, saved forever in people's memories. But um, that's the way that it was done. But we, now we think it's time to uh, formalize that, especially as it's be become uh, more important in the public discussion on these issues. Um, I think that needs to be clearly defined, that decisions need to be um, subject to some kind of periodic review within inside the ERB, um, prohibit agencies from entering into specific non-disclosure agreements when they're given the uh, actual vulnerability um, and in, in, in a contract of some kind. Um, transfer the executive secretary function from the NSA to DHS, and most of that has to do with um, the transparency of the process that um, you, you, you can ensure better transparency if it's run by DHS. Um, that the uh, executive secretary has to issue a report on a regular basis. Uh, we would like that report to be, uh, to, to provide very high level numbers as to what is disclosed. So what, what is disclosed and then how long it's been kept for. So you get a sense in the aggregate of how it's been used. Uh, the, uh, there have been, um, uh, government officials that have said uh, that of the first hundred that went through the vet process, I think it was 93 um, have been uh, disclosed and seven have been kept. Um, so that's the type of data that we're talking about being done in a report rather than in a, in a uh, um, anonymous uh, statement or a pseudonymous statement to a uh, reporter, uh, that it would be better to put that out in a report. Um, and to have that, uh, and, and the amount of time that they were kept as well to give people a sense of how long these, this process is taking um, as we go along and whether they're improving over time. Uh, we think they should expand congressional oversight um, of the government of useful vulnerabilities uh, and also to uh, have independent oversight as well. So you would have the ability for the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board uh, to review and inspector generals um, of the different agencies to review as well. Uh, and then we think that uh, it's important at the same time to expand both funding for the offensive uh, capabilities in this space because you will see greater turnover um, of vulnerabilities as we start to uh, go through them so to make sure that we can stay up to speed. We see a uh, more um, better uh, offensive nature there and also on the defensive side that as they're taking in the vulnerabilities that, that we are no, know that we're patching uh, at a better rate than we have in the past to make up for this because you'd hopefully increase the patches as well and hopefully incre um, increase the ability of other researchers disclosing to vendors at the same time so that we can help to uh, generally improve the environment around uh, th these in, in this way. Uh, and that's basically it. I hope that we can get to questions and go through in details and I'll, I'll pass things on back to Stephanie or to David. Thanks. And you can join the Presentations. See, no, they got to switch gone. it over there. So, oh, okay. Can we can we switch to the next one? I screwed it up. Slightly less PowerPointy. Okay. So the vulnerability equities process, 
a PR sham that only hurts our interests. Uh, in general, terrible idea. I'm going to go over why these things are true, uh, and I'm going to delve a little bit more into the technological. Obviously, I was not involved in creating the vulnerability equities process. Um, I've spent 20 years in this industry, though, and I may or may not know things about it. Uh, as you just heard, there are many goals of the vulnerability equities process. Um, I put check marks next to the ones that we kind of think may actually be true. Um, how, I mean, many of, transparency exercises are very important, and I think what you heard earlier was that it really became reinvigorated after the Snowden thing came out. So this is a reaction, I would say a knee-jerk reaction, to a PR problem with many American software companies, especially Apple, Google, Microsoft, Cisco, partners that we've had in government for many years, which had a very bad reaction to the things they saw coming out of the Snowden papers. Um, the, the thing about transparency exercises is, uh, if you go to your wife and you say, hey babe, uh, this morning at work, a really hot coworker hit on me and then I told her no, this is counterproductive, right? So if you've ever tried it, it's not a good idea. Uh, that is exactly what the VEP is. When you tell companies about vulnerabilities in their products, we know for a fact that for the last million years we've been involved in this, they do not like you more. In fact, they like you a lot less, and they ask a lot more questions, and you actually lose trust. That is what we have with the VEP. Uh, it is very hard to address strategic equities issues in cyber when you have counterproductive processes that remove trust instead of creating trust. And when you are at the same time doing the national security letters, the crypto war, thousands of these other issues that companies have direct opposition to you, it's no secret that Microsoft, Google, and Apple have teamed up to fight the government on almost all of these issues on a continual basis. Uh, this is the sort of thing that only creates noise. And the reason you see it is because vulnerabilities, and specifically O-Day, are intoxicating. They are sexy. They are fun to talk about. Uh, very few people know anything about them. What you have is a situation where, in a world of great technical and operational security uncertainty, we've tried to cover it with a thin process that feeds lawyers. And I want to just very briefly talk about O-Day. O-Day and vulnerabilities are really complex. When, you, when we originally looked at materials and, and we talked about atoms, we did not realize that inside every atom are, is this huge other periodic table of, you know, p of very primary particles that even now that we are having trouble finding, figuring out what a gluon really is, right? Um, so I have this list here, or this little uh, Prezi diagram. For something to be an O-day, not only is it a vulnerability that, that you know exists, but it also is a vulnerability that you know nobody else knows about. It has to be, uh, to, to, to make it work, when you're writing ODE, and especially in the government context, you may find seven or eight vulnerabilities that you then put into one working exploit. And that exploit may not work in the wild as well as you think, at which point you're gonna go back, collect more vulnerabilities, fix your exploit logic, and try again. The complexity of what makes a modern exploit is humongous. And so what I'm saying is, you do not know any of the questions that they claim to answer in the VEP about the technical capabilities of an exploit until you know it's useful for signals intelligence. Until it's been used and you can prove its usefulness, then you don't know it's even a real vulnerability that you, can, that, that you should give to someone else. Does that make sense? So, in, in, in a, okay. Here's what I'm saying is, for, for me to know that it's something worth worrying about, I have to go make my opponent worry about it for a while. I have to go test it in the wild. Otherwise, it may be something that is never really out there. So we'll come back to that. What I'm trying to give into your heads is that not only purely on a technical level, the decisions the vulnerability equities process is claiming to make are insanely complex and deal with unbounded uncertainty on lots of dimensions. And I listed three of them. One of them is defensive operational risk. 
And this is, for me to tell you that we are very vulnerable to something is very complex. In what configurations does that vulnerability exist? Do we have it out there in the wild? Is it something we can fix? Is it something we have mitigating factors that cover uh, against? Uh, that's, those are really hard questions. Um, you know, what is the business value of the assets that are under risk? That's, that's, you know, if you just work for companies, you will find that this is a very difficult question to answer that they struggle a lot with when prioritizing where to put their defensive budget. The technical understanding of the issues involved, and I just purely mean the vulnerabilities and the technical issues, uh, whether or not they relate to other things in your environment, all those very complex. The offensive operational opportunity, that alone is something that is unbounded. If you had told me a month ago that Russia was going to be our top priority from a signals intelligence perspective, we better bone up on free BSD, old free BSD locals, and a lot of uh, stuff in N Nginx, which is the web server that they've developed and used, then we would say, look, that's a lot of money. I don't think we're going to go there right now. But today, you really want it. Your operational opportunity costs are huge, and you don't know them ahead of time. Uh, so any one of these, to, to delve in for any exploit that I've written, any one of these issues would take man months, man months, humongous amounts of time to look at in a, in a thorough way where you could be certain that you are making the right decision. Um, and I, I can say that, therefore, you can determine, just from understanding the operational parameters and the level of effort of the vulnerability equities process, that it was not designed to be real, but was designed to try to attempt a PR um, effort. So I'm going to go over the costs to our country and to our um, allies of the VEP, because I think they're vastly underestimated. Uh, operational security uh, is, of course, one of those costs. Um, in your head, you always imagine using vulnerabilities, if you're in the policy space, as against some, some traditional small and medium business IT managers, right? Because that's how we feel when we're on the defensive standpoint. In the defensive standpoint, you feel like you're helpless, that nothing you have defends you, people keep clicking on everything, there's nothing you can do. In the offensive standpoint, you feel like um, you are attacking the Borg. You always assume that everything you use against someone else is going to immediately be perfectly defended against the next time. And if you use it again, you're putting every part of your tool chain at risk. You assume they can look deeply into their past and determine everything you've ever done with any mistake you make. And that is the level of operational security paranoia that you have to have as a professional operator. Uh, and of course, you assume that they've caught you without you knowing. Uh, and you do not get the feedback loop that you need to defend your operational skills. Uh, so knowing that, the best operational posture, the only one tra the traditional top-tier hackers use is we build our O-Day once for every target. A new O-Day, a new implant, a new exfil path, a new like C2 chain. Everything is unique. We don't look like anything else we've ever built, and we don't use anything else we've ever built. That is the only way it gets done in the wild when you're real. Uh, second best is, of course, using a tool chain, by which I mean the whole picture of your, of your operational cap capability, uh, only on one target set, so only on the Russian intelligence community, only on um, the Chinese defense indus industrial base. That is second best, and that's an economic path, because the other one's very expensive, let me tell you. Uh, worst is this idea of using something widely and then throwing it away and then rebuilding it and using it from an operational security perspective completely. This is what burns all your operations without you knowing it. The most painful part is you don't know when you're blown. And so I put a little picture of Anna Chapman there. If you remember, uh, she did not realize she was blown when she was blown. And it became very painful. And then she had to retire become a model. Um, so uh, attribution. Attribution is. Uh, very important, let's just say. Uh, when, when, you, when you give up bugs, and, I, and when, when the VEP has been used to give up bugs, and I, I know of a few examples, um, the attribution chain is irrevoc irrevocably blown, and they know that that vulnerability was used as part of a United States operation. Uh, it's, it's not a good thing. 
Uh, and then, of course, secure at Microsoft.com. And every security team uh, is not necessarily filled with patriotic American nationals. In fact, the Microsoft One is in India. So if you think you're sending the bug to an American company to get it fixed by Americans, you are sorely mistaken. And do not think the Indian government has missed out on this shining window of opportunity that they have from all the vulnerabilities coming in through their front door. From us, it's a ridiculous idea. Um, bugs don't always get fixed properly. So if you think that patching is a protective mechanism, then you may have missed when we sent them, when we, we had Stuxnet, link bug got compromised, Microsoft tried to fix the link bug and failed, and that we were still all completely vulnerable to it. Uh, smart companies introduce mitigating factors that do not depend on patching to their networks. It's a historical truth. Uh, and then the size of our effort against certain products, this, the, our capabilities become known. So uh, that's really the true damage. I have a whole other section on strategic weaknesses with the idea of the VEP that we go through. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about how our operational ca capability would be impacted should some of these recommendations be put into place. Um, when you hear the word um, vulnerability, you often assume that they are singular events, that they, they occur only sort of as a point product. But in fact, vulnerabilities are created as part of a technology chain. They're very much linked together. They are things that you find one, then the next one's much easier to find, then the next one's much easier than that even. So you are building a capacity uh, as you sort of do this. Um, and so they're very much not commodities. Uh, you know, the, the thing about vulnerabilities is that even determining what a vulnerability is uh, can be very complex. So, uh, attack surfaces. If I was to tell you, look, the memory manager of uh, Android has a lot of vulnerabilities when it handles multiple threads that are run concurrently uh, with a system called Ptrace. Right? Like, I'm just making that one up. But that's an attack surface. Then you could start focusing on that. Exposure of the attack surface can sometimes be more damaging to our overall strategic efforts than exposure of any one bug. And it's very hard to say that a smart person won't determine what attack surfaces you're looking at from looking at particular bugs that you feed them over time, uh, which is the exact problem that Turing had to work during World War II. Uh, exploitation techniques. The fact that you know you can exploit a particular vulnerability and that it is exploitable may be something that other people don't know. If I was to tell you we can break SSL in the following configuration, you could then go and backtrace and figure out what kind of math we've developed and where those weaknesses are. Uh, same thing's true for bug classes. A bug class would be something like format strings, buffer overflows, uh, cross-site scripting, use after free. They all have sort of weird names. Uh, knowing that a new bug class is prevalent and exploitable and very useful uh, is priceless intelligence to our competing uh, forces. Uh, and I will, I will point out very clearly here that no one has ever asked for a math equities process. No one has ever gone to the NSA and said, you know what, you guys know a lot of cool math that we don't know. This is the, like, w the obvious example of how much of a sham this whole process is, because if you, if you think that the math is less important than the vulnerabilities, then you're clearly missing out on how national security works. Uh, we, we don't have an ob She started off this conversation by saying, what are the obligations of the United States government when it comes to our security vendors or our software vendors? The answer is none. We have no obligations to them. We have a national interest in making sure that the commerce of the world is secure and that United States businesses can conduct that commerce in a secure fashion. We do not have an obligation to do QA for some of the richest companies on Earth. That is not a thing. Uh, and, and the other very clear flag that this is a sham is that no one ever asked what the overlap of the bugs we find and the bugs our adversaries find is. You never heard that question asked. It's as if it wasn't relevant to securing ourselves. But if you think about the problem, without that overlap, without understanding what level of that overlap is acceptable, you don't know if you're protecting yourself at all by releasing vulnerabilities. So um, it is very, if you've been in operations for a long time, as many of us have, it is really difficult to project the future technology used by your target sets. A useless bug today is a very useful bug tomorrow. 
Uh, you also don't know the level of painful exposure that you might have later. You don't know if all of a sudden your adversaries will wise up or Microsoft will patch you out. Uh, these are very expensive events. Uh, maybe Hal Martin uh, releasing all your tools, or maybe just someone wising up. These, these, all of a sudden, you can lose capability very fast. Um, and so what I'm arguing for here is the fact that we actually do need the largest head start on our adversaries as possible. We need a massive 10-year-long capacity gap between us and our nearest adversary, if at all possible. Uh, and, and part of that is because we need to help pull up our uh, friends in NATO and many of our partners with their operational capacity as well. Uh, and we need to do all this without trying to make everything as expensive as possible. I hope no one is looking to spend another $10 billion on exploit development. But the last recommendation he has where we increase budget, you have to ask how much. Because the, the things he recommends in the paper would increase your budget uh, insane amounts of, like, orders of magnitude more than they already are, and they have been very high for a long time. So this is a comic that uh, it turns out the words are a little hard to read. Um, uh, but nonetheless, it's just an example of you know, the processes that you go through to determine these questions are very expensive. Uh, you know, and, and from an engineer's perspective, it's very hard to recruit people who will then do all this work and then give it to Microsoft. That's what Microsoft is for. Um, so, underinvestment. When you do, this is a very subtle point uh, because there are also indirect consequences to the vulnerability equities process as a policy, and they are also bad. I wrote horrible, but we'll just stick with bad. Um, so, uh, whoop, you know, it's hard, harder to read. I didn't zoom in on this. Um, here's the thing. If you follow through with the vulnerability equities process, you essentially force the government agencies to start outsourcing everything they do. Uh, it was very interesting when he said that he wanted to, to go the other direction and mandate that, that government agencies would not be able to license vulnerabilities under a non-disclosure agreement. Uh, that's as if you have full control and perfect control of the whole market, instead of a long and, and tenuous international supply chain. Uh, if, if we did follow through with that, uh, recommendation, what would happen is they would sell to other people, uh, which is a very bad consequence on our, in our, for our national security. Uh, there's, there's certainly an aspect of the vulnerability equities process that teaches our adversaries um, all of the bug classes that we can find, and then keeps us from building up a body of knowledge and, and a critical mass, which I think is, is probably pretty negative. Um, so here's, here's what I would recommend. Uh, and I didn't put it in a nice paper, but I wrote it here. And then there's another, there's a whole conversation on Lawfare, which is a policy blog that you can go read. Um, so I would say, do not tell your wife that uh, people are coming on to you at work. Uh, try finding other confidence building measures that work better. Um, you can address systemic risk, which is part of what you're trying to look at via many other mitigations. And I, I looked at Einstein 3 here as an example. I think we need to push Einstein 3 to our, our third party partners. I think uh, they should be on the boundaries of every NATO country if we can figure out a way to make that diplomatically accessible. Uh, and vulnerability finding, we know from a technology perspective, is not, it's not how you secure yourself. It really isn't. Uh, this has to be platform changes that, that make the difference. So, that's the sort of thing you can do with systemic risk. Uh, if you find a vulnerability that you yourself are very, very vulnerable to, uh, then one thing you can do is find a way to configure all government systems to protect yourself without revealing the vulnerability. It's, it's not as, as sexy as giving stuff to the software vendors, but it, in fact, works better. So those are the attempted fixes. And um, uh, the defined time spans but, uh, idea uh, it's the easiest way to destroy your operational capability while increasing your costs at 10 times. Um, moving the functionality to somewhere other than NSA, I think uh, the, down, the major downside is almost all of our technical know-how about the operations and about the, the way vulnerabilities work is still at NSA. So as much as it's really a staffing problem, uh, it, it's also almost a mission problem, but 
but clearly staffing is an issue. Uh, continuing codifying the vulnerability equities process, I think um, definitely the wrong direction. I actually don't think this will happen if you read the tea leaves of how government is working right now. Uh, there's not that much momentum toward codifying it into law. Um, and then limiting the number of bugs you can hold, uh, issuing quota systems, I've heard people wanting that. Um, that. That assumes that you really don't want to continue the mission. And this is you know, integrated into some of our most important military and uh, intelligence missions uh, that we have right now. And uh, I would say that, look, these, this is a policy that's caused massive collateral damage. And we did it without asking for the metrics that we could have done ahead of time. Uh, in, a, in a much more technological way. When you don't understand the physics and the internal uh, behavior of vulnerabilities, uh, they seem simple. They seem, they seem like what you read about on the news. Uh, but you do have to spend day in and day out looking at vulnerabilities every day. The numbers that people come up with, uh, oh, we have 100 vulnerabilities, we released 93 of them. I believe that about as much as I believe the Baltimore police reports. Um, look, it, it's just... It's not correct, all right? So it's true. Uh, we saw the wire. You know how this works. Um, I, I personally, as a private company with, with you know, under $10 million of revenue, I deal with 10 vulnerabilities a week, many of which are critical, right? So uh, this is, I mean, just if you look at what uh, the, the capacities are for you know, other organizations, their budgets, um, I just I think we sh we we did not do the studies we should have done when thinking about this policy we've made the wrong choice and it's time to go back. Um, thank you. Steve. So I, I I guess I get to be here to say that. No, not quite. Uh, <laughs> there's no a lot of what he said is. Correct, but not all. And, you know, intelligence certainly matters. The ability of, say, the US intelligence community to function is important. I've written elsewhere that spying will go away sometime well after a sustained outbreak of world peace. I do not expect, it's clear that I'm not going to live to see that, and I don't think it's in the foreseeable future. It doesn't seem to be in the cards, but defense matters too. And you know, the purpose of an intelligence community, the purpose of Cyber Command with its offensive mission is to protect the country. And there are more, there's more than one way to achieve that protection. And the VEP for all its flaws is a part of that and you can't ignore it. It's great to harden systems, you know, I've, Stephanie said, I've uh, done reverse engineering almost 50 years ago. When I was in high school, I wanted to learn how the operating system worked, so I wrote my own disassembler. Yes, that system was a lot simpler than the ones we have today. You know, I found my share of security flaws, and you know, there's nothing more fun than finding a new attack, but my heart is really in defense. I'm a privacy guy, I'm a defense guy, I really prefer to defend things. And you can't actually accomplish that because too many software developers don't know how to do that. I was looking at a study, uh, cryptography in mobile applications, and this is fairly simple, straightforward cryptography. 80% of them, 80% of mobile apps studied, 87% of Android apps studied, get the cryptography wrong. And this is simple, straightforward cryptography. Companies like Microsoft can do a really good job of hardening their software. Windows 10, I'm a Mac user, Windows 10 is probably the most secure commercial operating system that's ever been fielded. And every month, there are critical vulnerabilities in Windows 10. And that's from one of the most sophisticated companies in getting this right, with the more than quarter of a billion dollars that they have spent on their software development lifecycle but they're not the only player out there. There are, I don't even know, hundreds of thousands of independently developed apps out there, and that's where the vulnerabilities really are. Never mind the internet of broken things that we all <laughs> learned yesterday could take out some of the biggest websites, uh, web services on the planet, like Twitter and Spotify. Even Amazon reportedly had some trouble that was linked to that. So 
it's nice to try to harden things. This is my you know, professional focus, but it's not going to do the job by itself. We have to close the holes when they occur despite all of this. And attacks are rediscovered, reinvented, leaked. Edward Snowden, Edward Snowden 2.0, shadow brokers, compromised systems that are found by our adversaries and reverse engineered. We now know a lot about Stuxnet and Duquo and Flame and Gauss because they were found in the wild and now lots of people know what vulnerabilities these things exploited. For that matter, we don't know when we penetrate a Russian system, a Chinese system, or what have you system, we don't know if they have actually found this or not. Maybe they have found it and they've walked it back and they have found what we are doing to them and now they have uh, their own Einsteinovich system uh, <laughs> watching what we are doing. Maybe someday we'll discover this. Maybe we've got a good enough uh, SIGINT capability, uh, LINT capability to learn, oh, this particular exploit chain is blown and they've been watching us. It's going to happen. And we don't know when they're launching it, not launching it against DHS.gov from abroad where Einstein's going to pick this up but from one site inside the US against another site inside .com in the US where Einstein isn't watching because the NSA has no legal authority to go monitor domestic communications. The FBI's authority to look at domestic communications is strictly limited to things like probable cause with a search warrant. I don't think anyone wants the FBI watching all domestic communications. Uh, it, certain, it would not go over very well, shall we say, even if you thought it was going to be effective, and I don't think it would be effective. There's just too much of it out there. So we've got to take some of these vulnerabilities and disclose them in the proper fashion at the proper time to the proper parties. It, the skills to find these holes are out there. The, uh, Dave wrote in his law flag, blog post that the hacker community doesn't know what kind of vulnerabilities the intelligence community finds useful. I'm not entirely convinced of that, even if that were true in the abstract. Well, sometimes these things do get stolen, leaked, reverse engineered, and people learn. But even if that were true, the basic exploit finding skills are demonstrably out there when you look at some of the sophisticated exploit chains that have been shown to exist in the wild. You know that the ability to find these holes is out there. I, I would liken it to someone, a civilian, who's learned to be an expert marksman. And she enters the army, and does she shoot at enemy soldiers, commanders, antennas, drones. That's a tactical decision that someone in the civilian world might not, probably does not have any clue about. You redirect the same skills towards your tactical objective. It's the same is true of hackers. Once they learn what is useful to the SIGINT community, to the cyber command, they will learn to do this, and this is happening because of all these things that leak. In that matter, take Stuxnet, one of the better documented pieces of uh, attack software out there. Some of it's zero days, two if I recall correctly. I see Kim Zetter sitting in the audience. I'm not going to try, I'll qualify it. We're not, in fact, zero days. We're not completely unknown. I don't know where the authors of Stuxnet uh, got them, whether they reinvented it or found this, but the vendors didn't know about this and didn't fix it. These tools are out there, and when appropriate, you've got to get them fixed. So you've got to find a balance. I am not saying that immediately disclose all vulnerabilities, though even when something's out there, studies have shown it takes about 11 months for a patch actually to get out there uh, in the wild. Uh, 
And some things are not particularly patchable. Most of these Internet of Broken Things uh, pieces of software are never going to be patched for quite a variety of reasons. The exploit, of course, is to gain access. A lot of the payload, here is a router. I want to monitor the traffic that's going through it. The payload is not the same as the exploit. The payload does not need to be, should not be disclosed. You find one way into the router, fine. You find another way into the router, also fine. You can use most of the same payload. And again, the bad guys know this. They have loader dropper architectures for planting their malware. So this is well understood technology. There are certainly some exploits that are uniquely valuable. You don't disclose them. And we even see the analog in the criminal law. The wiretap law says that after a certain period of time, the fact of the wiretap has to, by law, be disclosed to the target. And you know what? The law also says, for good cause, the judge can extend the secrecy order. So we already know how to do this. We already have a process for keeping certain things secret for longer than the normal period of time. If there's a good reason to keep something uh, secret for longer, then you do so. The, do so. The VEP says we balance these things. We look at how useful it is to the U.S. We look at what the risks are to the U.S. from not disclosing it. We look at other measures, Einstein or other uh, monitoring techniques to see is this being used against us by our adversaries? How hard was it to, dis to discover this? What are the odds that somebody else is going to find it? But we don't really know the details of how this works in practice, and that's a problem. We don't know whether or not the VEP is actually fulfilling its purpose, which is to make the systems more secure. So that is where we uh, really need to focus. Is this working well? And if it's not working as well as it should, how do we fix this? Thanks. Thank you. So my colleagues at the ACI can no longer accuse me of putting together panels where everyone agrees. <laughs> <laughs> And in the spirit of disagreement, what I'd like to do is give, for a few minutes, each of our panelists an opportunity to respond to each other. So Ari, if you'd like to start. So I will say, as usual, I strongly agree with Steve. So I can't remember a time I've been on a panel where I've had to disagree with Steve. But, and that probably shows that I... Uh... Well, I'll have to disagree with you slightly. <laughs> there you go. Point. <laughs> PCLOB can't do it. By law, its scope is limited to counterterrorism, and that's not... There, there are may, many other targets of uh, for SIGINT vulnerabilities and so on, and PCLOB by law can't look at that. And just in case anyone doesn't know the acronym PCLOB, the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board. We'll put that aside for now, because there's ways around that, but we'll, we'll put that aside. Um, the, um, I, Dave, however, I mean, I, I strongly agree with Steve's point on that if you care about def yeah, if you only care about offense, if offense is the only, literally the only thing that's important, Dave's right, right? However, if defense matters at all, even a little bit, Dave's wrong, <laughs> period. That's, that's, that's the calculus, right? If you care about defense, right, how do we go about making sure defense works? Because defense has not been working that well, right? And if we, we want defense to get better, we need to start acting like that. Number two, the business community is not married to the government, right? The government is the, the, the companies are not the wife of the, of, the, of, of the government, right? So saying, making them mad at you doesn't matter. Doing what is ethically the right thing to do is the government's responsibility in this case. And the US government in particular needs to set a model of that for the rest of the world. We are held to a higher standard, and we like being held to a higher standard, as, the pre as President Obama said, right? That's the way we want it. So therefore, we must do, we must sometimes do, do things that make things a little bit difficult. They might be mad at us for a little bit. That's the way it is, sorry. They're not our wives. Um, number, number two, he didn't work in the government during the VEP creation, during the recreation of the VEP. He doesn't know that it caused massive collateral damage. He doesn't know that 
uh, the, what studies were done and what studies weren't done. He has no idea. But yet he states this plainly as though that's the fact. Why is that? Because offense is way, 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 way more important than defense. In fact, defense doesn't matter at all. Right? And if that's the case, you're going to find the holes and you're going to say these things even though they're not possibly true. Okay? Lastly, the thing that makes me the most upset in this particular case, you can tell I'm getting worked up. <laughs> the, he says that it's a PR, the VEP is a PR sham, right? When was the VEP created? The VEP crew was created during the Bush administration, CNCI. Why did they think it was a good idea? Because they wanted it to be a PR sham? No, it was completely classified at the time. After Snowden, the VEP was recreated. Did, was it released in a big fanfare? Was there a big party that was held? Did the president mention it during his, his uh, PPD 29 speech that he gave at the Justice Department in January? No, it didn't come up at all. The time it came up was after Heartbleed, when the mainstream media was started going around saying that the government knew about Heartbleed before it happened. And there was a feeling that it had, we, that had to be debunked. Our credibility was, was already being taken down because of Snowden. We had to make, be able to make this step and show that we were, we, were, we were better than that. And that was the reason that the vet was made public. It had nothing to do. It would, have stayed, it would have stayed behind the scenes completely forever had that not happened. Now, are there benefits from it being public? I think there are. That's why I wrote this paper, right? I think that there are, there are benefits. I think, and, and the lack of trust that has sort of cycled us down here demonstrates that we need to do that. The fact that companies don't patch or that their patches don't work, right? That doesn't mean you give up on defense, right? You have to still continue to work with the companies to get them to do it. Sometimes they don't patch them, right? You give it to them, they don't patch it. How has that hurt us more than if we had, had tried, just tried to like, you know, work with them and come up with a patch ourselves and get it out there if we thought that it was something that was really going to do, be, be something that was going to hurt, hurt folks around the world? We, we have to be able to work with the companies and try and work with the companies and get them to do what is the right thing to do if we can do it. So with that, I'll stop them. All right. All right. So I'm not going to address whether or not I know what I'm talking about. Uh, those of you who know me know that I do. Uh, he made an ethical argument. It's not about ethics. It really isn't. Uh, this is an argument uh, whether or not that we are acting in the best interest of the United States uh, in maintaining uh, what I like to think of as a hegemony, uh, a beneficial one, uh, along with our allies and partners. Uh, there, the, uh, the obvious reason to disclose a vulnerability from a defensive standpoint is when it has become a clear and present danger. And that's really the only time you should do it. Uh, that is not leaning toward disclosure, as Michael Daniels would put it. That is acknowledging that you have a severe risk that you are going to directly mitigate, uh, which is a much more reasonable posture and is not the posture uh, as currently uh, disclosed. Um, you know, it's very interesting because he asked this question of what are the odds that someone else will find it? Uh, so in this case, talking about vulnerabilities. Um, I will say that that's the kind of question that you should answer before you concoct something like this. Because if the odds are really low, that changes your decision-making capability in the space. Uh, so the fact that we don't have a publicized answer to that question tells me a lot about the nature of what I will still contend is a pure PR sham. And it's not a PR sham to the American people. It has nothing to do with the American people. This is something that is uh, directly sent to the industry that was mad at us, in this case, uh, Cisco, Microsoft, Google, and the, and the like. And vulnerabilities is really such a very small lever to move security. Obviously, defense matters. And that's why the IAD and SIGINT institutions are merging within the NSA, because they are one and the same at a certain level. Uh, there are two sides of the same coin, as Brian Snow would say. Um, the, the downside, though, is vulnerabilities and releasing vulnerabilities gives you a very, very tiny hold on the problem. It's not something that you can use to change your defensive posture. What you can use is education. 
So at some point when we do, I work for a security consulting company, so when we do security consulting, we don't think of it as, oh, we're going to find all the vulnerabilities and therefore you'll be safer. We think of it as, this is an educational opportunity to you, for you to learn about the types of vulnerabilities you are most at risk for so that you can fix them at the root cause, whatever that is. Uh, that is how you communicate with an industry partner, be they a customer or a uh, partner from government or anything else. Um, because if I went to Microsoft right now and said, hey, here's 100 vulnerabilities, they'd say, great, we will add that to our giant pile of internally discovered thousands of vulnerabilities that we kind of are already kind of working through as fast as we can. So that's just one of the many reasons vulnerabilities are not where you move the lever on this issue of defense. So I'm not coming out and arguing that defense is not important. I think defense is very important. I think the vulnerabilities we find as part of government, as part of extremely expensive offensive investigations, are important for offense. They are not how you help defense. You, he mentioned we, we don't have the authorities to install, actually I think it was you who said it, we don't have the authorities to install Einstein 3 within the United States. That to me sounds like where we need to be focusing. Maybe we need to find a way for government to help industries without releasing the vulnerabilities and other information we know, the indicators of compromise, to those industries. And we've suggested things like a government-run cloud platform that is instrumented so that we can protect other industries and agencies from malware without releasing our indicators of compromise. That's the sort of activity, large-scale, strategic, White House-level capacity that you need to build from an equities perspective to give you something to do that does not do nothing. What we have here is something that cannot be effective, was never really meant to be effective, in fact, hurts us operationally much more than was projected, and I think is even understood at high levels, uh, and should be stopped. And I'll, I'll stop too. Yeah, I don't. I don't really have much to respond. I will. Uh, yeah, I do think that trying to sell the American public on the notion that there should be more explicit monitoring. People already think that the NSA and or the FBI and or some strange, you know little green men or whatever are monitoring all their communications now, even when it is demonstrably not true and not legal and there's no evidence for it, trying to say, well, yeah, I know you don't think, I know you think we're doing that, but let's really do it. This is a com complete and total non-starter politically, legally, and I suspect ethically and morally. Uh, and the Einstein 3 signatures are classified, at least some of them, so you can't easily do it in other ways. So you've got to be very, very careful. It, might it be effective? I'm not even convinced of that, but uh, it certainly uh, is an extremely difficult and probably unwise path to go down. I mean, I mean the, enti the entire security, sorry not to cut in here, but the entire security community is moving further and further away from signature-based solutions, and yet that's the solution that you're yeah. proposing. So, I mean, not to say that it's not needed at all, and I think it is, and I work to help to build Einstein and make it work within the government and the, the critical infrastructure program that is in place that people are using, right? But it's just not the whole solution. It's a, it's a small part of the solution and becoming a smaller and smaller piece of the solution. Though, uh, I, I will say there is one thing in which you and I, I think very strongly agree that uh, Understanding these exploits and making the decisions about them requires a very deep technical knowledge, and I am concerned that there is not enough technical expertise that goes into the evaluation process. You know, uh, a lot of government lacks the technical expertise to understand. I in my, currently in my second stint working for a government agency to lend technical expertise to the lawyers and policymakers. Uh, I hasten to add that what I'm saying today is strictly my own opinions and has no relation to any government agencies, past, present, future, hypothetical or real. Uh, but we do need a lot more technical expertise that goes into these into the decision process because it's not just something where you can put it into a spreadsheet and uh, and look at the dollars, euros, pounds, rubles, what have you. Uh, they're really you don't understand this at just that level. You do need the technical understanding. And I think we can very strongly agree on that part. And also from the operational side. I, from the operational side, too, although I hesitate to uh, let only the NSA uh, supply that, that expertise 
because they have a bi they are a biased party in the discussion. Well, that was that was another thing that I just where I disagree with Dave too, where he was saying that um, if we have if you move the function out of NSA, no one's talking about NSA not being involved in the function, right? The question is just whether they should be the executive secretary. That's literally the title. Should NSA be the executive secretary? Um, and what does that mean? That, that doesn't mean that you, you take the expertise out, right, and that you don't have those people participate. Yeah, so you, I want to just make that. Recent amendments to uh, FISA, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, call for, call it public advocate, advocate to the other side, an analog, though I don't want to go too far down the implications of the Catholic Church's sainted process where you have the literally devil's advocate, the advocate for the other side. Uh, I think that would be a good input into uh, the VEP to say, okay, you know, here's what I think uh, the public interest demands, not just Cyber Command, SIGINT, what have you. You know, IAD is one voice for that, but of course, as the more that IAD gets merged with the SIGINT function, the more difficult that becomes, and even IAD is not viewed with uh, as an unmixed benefit by the public at large who don't know what it actually does. So I'm going to ask the panel one question, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Um, this question kind of comes out of a comment, Dave, that you made here today, and that I think that you also cover in your Lawfare blog post. You've stated that we don't have uh, enough understanding, or there isn't enough research done on the overlap between bugs that or vulnerabilities that we, the United States, find and our adversaries find. And then that kind of research um, needs to inform this process. Um, so general question to all of you is, do we need that kind of research? And to Dave, if all of a sudden um, there was research indicating that there was rediscovery and rediscovery by our adversaries on a semi-regular basis, how would that change your view, if no at one, all? No one's denying that there's, that no one's saying there's no rediscovery. People are saying that, that we don't know what the percentage is, but we also don't know what the policy percentage is for how much we're willing to bear. So those are two very important questions that have never been asked and should have been asked long before we started this. Uh, I think that uh, when, we, when we did an informal Twitter survey, you'll, you'll hear anyone who has technical expertise writing vulnerabilities or using vulnerabilities says that it's actually fairly rare. Not non-existent, but pretty rare. Uh, that's, that's an indicator to me, if I look at what Project Zero does versus what IBM X-Force does, if they're overlapping very little, I'm gonna say that we probably overlap very little with what the Chinese do. And you see that operationally, the Chinese get caught using word vulnerabilities that are very unique to them and their style. That's how we can determine the style of an, of an adversary organization. I would say that, um, you know, Determining that overlap is very hard work. Uh, tracking vulnerabilities and un really understanding them at that level is not something you do in a simple spreadsheet with a, sim with a whim. This is a long-term multi-year engagement with trained data scientists who also understand vulnerabilities. Uh, and that never happened. So that, that's how I get the feeling for this, unless he's contending that it did happen and he has the numbers. Right I will here. say uh, two things on to that. That's a great idea for research. I think someone should be doing that. Number two, Dave has no idea what research has been done, period. That's all I'll say. Uh, the, uh, uh, Dan Gear has phrased what you said uh, slightly differently. The question is whether vulnerabilities, useful vulnerabilities are sparse or dense. And uh, what you are saying is that they are locally dense, but there are many different clusters. I'll say there's a, there's a density function, and we do not know what the density function is and oh. what the parameters are that go into the density function. And we don't know whether or not we know, but at least not in this audience. I think we, but, uh, if, if Ari knew, he would tell us right now, and he doesn't know. And that's what tells me how this was built. Not breaking any laws, right? I mean, that doesn't really make much sense, so. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Let's open up the questions to the audience, please. You got one right here. Um, Choose someone okay. hard. 
He looks uh, this hardcore. is going to be this is something you want to hear. And around 2011, Dan Guido from NYU Poly came to DARPA to show us a presentation of some information he had collected. He had spent a year having his grad students evaluate commercial malware, criminal malware, because he didn't want to run a file of classification. He's done this presentation since. In every case, the malware he evaluated, he was able to trace back to a prior announcement of vulnerability. The purpose of the presentation he was doing to point out that these announcements were being caused because at least in the criminal world, they weren't creating them. They were just going back to what we tell them about and then following it from there. And Dave, I think you know Don Guido, so you can probably get the presentation yourself. There's, there's not really any, there hasn't been for any doubt for a long time that the bad guys mostly don't use zero days. They f happily reverse patches that come out from Microsoft, Apple, what have you, and then start exploiting it because people don't patch their systems. And in fact, there's an inverse correlation between the size of an organization and when it installs patches. And that's not good and we have to, it, a important research question is how can we get these patches out there sooner, more quickly, and hope that the patch doesn't break something else in the process. Uh, we've seen many examples of pa vendor patches breaking systems. So it, yeah, it's a very serious problem, uh, but the alternative is often to leave it unpatched. There was one day if, some years ago where we almost lost the internet because they large class of very serious vulnerabilities in all major routers was found, and the big ISPs had to, had to push out patches coordinated uh, in almost, with almost no time for the regular routine testing. We are very lucky we did not lose the internet that day, or a large chunk of it, from some of those patches being buggy. So yeah, how to handle patching is a serious and unsolved problem in one of my research areas. If there are classes of bad guys who don't, mostly don't use O-Days and simply get their information from patches, doesn't that make an argument not to send more information down the pipeline to Microsoft so that they can generate more patches? Microsoft is releasing these patches frequently anyway. In fact, <laughs> they're moving faster. Uh, Windows 10 pushes patches out to consumers period, without asking. And I, it frankly scares me a little bit given the non-zero brick rate, but uh, it's a, they felt that they don't have a choice. I mean, we, we, I, it, it, to follow up on Steve's point, I think that um, in the previous one he made, you know, what I see in my work, my regular work now, is I go to these companies and uh, that we're, we're trying to get good governance structures for and, and could put, put good patching into place. And what we see is that the ones that, it's actually not necessarily the larger ones, it's the ones that have bought up more companies more recently, right? So if you buy up lots of companies really quickly, then you're taking all of these legacy systems and you're trying to patch them all at the same time and something breaks between them, right? That's, that's the number one thing. So if we can overcome some of those issues uh, of, um, you know, and get the patches out there more quickly, that would, that's really the, the solution to this. I think not patching is not really, a, 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 and getting less patches is not really the direction we need to head. We need more patches done, done right. Can we pick Trey? Because I know he wants a piece of us. I'd like to thank you all for a very uh, entertaining session so far. I, I hate to be a person who prognosticates, but I, I've heard, I, there's one word that ha I've uh, been waiting to hear and I haven't heard from all three of you, and that word is automation. What DARPA Grand Challenge has shown us is the time frame of 11 months from discovery to patch. Um, within several years, we're going to be talking about not what vulnerability do we disclose, but how much faster do our algorithms um, uh, generate vulnerabilities and patch them, and how much faster uh, compare from us compared to our adversaries. And so it becomes less a question of um, legal at disclosure versus our algorithms versus their algorithms as the process automates. And I'd just love to hear your thoughts. It's very interesting how the Cyber Grand Challenge also had an equities process built into it where you would avoid patching if you knew that the other people did not discovered it. So I think, honestly, I think it's a very nascent effort. I think we're just starting down that path. It, I don't think we know where we end up. It's a wonderful research effort. It is research. My guess is that it's decades away from commercialization. The, uh, it, it, at least in large scale, you know, the, 
hope for this succeeding has been the self-driving car. And yeah, 10 years ago when DARPA did that, it was quite surprising. And you know what? We're still not really ready to put self-driving cars into production. There's still a lot of research going on. There's still a lot of very, very hard problems which are not really well solved in the self-driving cars. And security is worse because you, than self-driving cars because you're dealing with an intelligent adaptive adversary who is not going to sit still and say, and say oh no, DARPA's got their self-fixing software. We're just going to fold our tents and go home. Though they, just like the virus writers didn't stop when, uh, when the first antivirus software came out. They came up with polymorphic viruses and encrypted payloads and so on and so on. Uh, you're going to find malware that detects the auto patching and adapts to it as well. Uh, it's an interesting research effort. My guess is it's still a couple of decades away from really solving the problem, if indeed it can. I hope we're less than a couple decades away, but you know, I do think- I hope so, I, but- But, but uh, one thing I would say is it still doesn't solve the problem of you give the vulnerability to the company and they do nothing with it, right? So there is the, I mean, yeah, we would speed it up, but they have, there's these dilemmas that companies face all the time about how they should go about patching. You know, there needs to be a little bit more pressure on the company to actually do the patch. Right, um, as well as knowing that it's going to be quick. I think, his, I think his point is that the system will fix itself. Yeah, I'll, so. I'll, I'll skip my timeline, but my general rule for something that involves a major change like this is just engineering deployment takes 15 years. If we had the full solution today, it's 15 years before it's out there. Do it. All right, so bring the heat. Quick question for you guys. Uh, it strikes me that there is something of ships passing in the night here with the ethics around arguments uh, of ethics versus pragmatism. Um, Dave, you make a striking point, and it, it makes a lot of sense, right, that these are interlinked pieces of information and that in disclosure we're revealing substantial amounts of research effort and work output in terms of where the IC is targeting its work. But Ari, I think, also, and Steve make a good point that this is the nature of the business and life is going to be hard, right? And it's going to get a lot harder if you're a democracy than if you're any other state in this space. So, so two questions for you guys, a simple one and potentially more challenging. First, if we're gonna disambiguate patch application and patch creation for the moment, just deal with patch creation, should the VET process turn on vendors' patch performance? All right, so point question for you. And the second is this, Thank you. how do you value, right, we talk about the gain loss situation in terms of losing access to an exploit on the IC side. How do you value the disclosure of a vulnerability to a vendor? talked about rediscovery, we've talked about the potential use somewhere else. It seems that we have a more formal process, we have a better understanding of how to value that loss of that volume within the government. But how do you value the loss of that volume to the vendor through non-disclosure? I would say we don't have the answers to either of those questions or have even begun to study them in a realistic, rigorous way, requiring actual data instead of just building models out of thin air and then pretending we can run numbers through them, which is what you tend to see, right? Like, you need to have real data. And you, that suit, getting the corpus of data alone is a five-year process. So once we've answered those questions, we should maybe re-enable the DEP, uh, or the VEP, sorry. So I think number one is, the, for question number one, it's a great, they're, they're both great questions. Number one, I would, I, I take and I separate from the VEP, right? Like the fact, what the company does with it on their side is a separate question. Again, I said before, like there should be, you know, we have to figure out how to get more pressure onto some of these companies to act on, on, on them. But that's a separate question as to whether you give it to them or not, right? The, the question of whether you give it to them is the, are those questions that Michael Daniel laid out in his blog post, right? Of, um, you know, what is, the, what is the mission, how, how is this going to affect our mission? You know, how, what, what, is, what is this going to do for, to us long term if we were to disclose this? Those are the questions you ask. It's up to the company, right, on their side to decide what, what they're going to do with it and, and, and that piece of it. Separate, it. It's out of the hands of the government. Actually, you know, I think, I think, he, I think that is an, interest, an interesting point. Uh, if, 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 if I'm a foreign power and find some exploit in really need apps.com's software, I'm going to try to hack into them to, to get their vo uh, bug vulnerability database to see if they get any interesting disclosures. And if there's a company that's not actually doing something with things you disclose to them, don't give them more because maybe they've been hacked. Uh, I would, if you, if you I think, think Microsoft has not been hacked, then you are crazy right now. 
If you think the Chinese do not have access to the secure at Microsoft domain, then it's insane. If there's no way, I know they're sitting here. I just like to pick on them. So <laughs> the same thing's true for all of them. She's loving it. She's loving it. But uh, the same, I mean, the same thing. Uh, how many bugs have we get sent to Huawei through the vulnerability equities process? Lots, right? Would we even be talking about this Lots? if these were not American no, companies? No, I think, I think, Lots I think of the bugs answers. get sent to Huawei through the vulnerability equities process. That's Where great. do you get this? I'm just curious. Where does this come from? Where do I come you from? You don't know what's happening in, you don't know what's happening in the vulnerability equities process. Like, that's an insane <laughs> statement. <laughs> Completely crazy. It, it, the, the, <laughs> The fact that you don't know who I am, I think, is I a, do know a who you are. Thing. I'm just saying I don't understand what, how you can make that statement. You have no idea what's going on. You don't know what's happening in the vulnerability equities process. I think I That's do. the whole point. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think understanding vulnerabilities is the first step to understanding vulnerability equities process. Let's put it that way. And on that note, I've, I've been told uh, by organizers in the back that we have to stop. I'm sorry, Katie. I really am. You can, <laughs> if Colonel Hall wants to give me two, one more question. Give her a there question. we go. All right, let's let Katie ask a question. And <laughs> go, 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 come to the podium for your question. Just ask the question, we'll repeat it. Okay, first of all, do you know who I am? No. <laughs> all right, so uh, this, is, this is probably appropriate because I was going to pontificate and not apologize for it at all. Um, so there, there were so many areas where I, I was, I mean, I was trying to live tweet this fight club situation that was happening over here, but I couldn't keep up with it. But I mean, I think, so a couple of things I just wanted to point out. Um, I think, I mean, I think everyone's agreeing with Dave in that the, you need much higher degree of deep technical knowledge in order to uh, uh, adequately make any of these assessments, right? right? So that's one. But, I mean, absolutely, uh, there are some, I mean, you're super entertaining, Dave, which is what makes you believable in all of these <laughs> things that you say, and yet, you know, I got to call shenanigans on a couple of the things, like the fact that the MSRC is not actually in India. That's not true. So, you know, I mean, certain things that are kind of being tossed out here, and that's just one example, um, interwoven with some very, very astute points. I'm worried about the fact that we're muddying this too much. And the, and the, the thing about it is, is that, I mean, if there were a question for you guys, it's um, how do we kind of get to a place where the publicly verifiable facts of this situation can be assessed? Um, and to your, like, lovely dig at my modeling research, which actually looks at uh, the overlap uh, of bug collisions and the, and the rediscoverability of bugs. Thank you so much for that. Um, but the point of the matter is, if you don't have publicly accessible, verifiable little bits of these facts, then you have a problem. And the, by, by definition, the rediscovery um, issue is one that's going to have data that is only accessible to the internal organizations and internal teams. And so that is very difficult to, to put out forward. Um, so anyway, my question for you guys is how do we get to a place where we have enough publicly verifiable um, resources and definitions and locations of security response teams, for example, you know, and all of that stuff such that the, the nuggets of truth that you do have in there um, can come through and we can come up with the solutions? That's the question. Well, my answer to that is there are a fair number of, of oversight agencies within the government that regularly audit other processes. I don't know which is best for this, but if you ask me to say, you know, pick something, I'd say use one of those as the model. Take something like the GAO, which is generally regarded as nonpartisan and competent, have them look at it. Maybe it's PCLOB with an amendment to the law. Maybe it's some, uh, an inspector general, maybe it's, I don't know, but that would be the model I would use because it is going to be highly classified. You can't disclose some of this data. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, that's my, my, that was the point of our paper too, where you know, we said very clearly you need to have oversight because a lot of this stuff is gonna have to remain classified and you're not gonna be able to separate it out and make the entire thing transparent. So you gotta have enough transparency and enough of our working democratic oversight mechanisms that people feel comfortable with it. That's the goal, right? Not to make information widely available about, the, about uh, our offensive capabilities. 
it wasn't a dig at your research, but there is a yeah. lack of of the ability to make valid decisions based on data because we do not I have think, the data. And I think putting process in place before you've made a study on the data is very odd. I think all. Possible. I mean, I think as as Katie said, and I didn't say this before, and I'll say it again: more data and more uh, technical knowledge would be a great thing for the VAP. Absolutely, 100% agree with that. We have a conference in uh, Miami you should come to <laughs> where you can learn all about vulnerability. Okay, on that note, we've got to go. Let's thank our panelists.